بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه I've been started in the name of Allah, the most beneficent and the most merciful. I want to crave the indulgence of the organizers and the totality of the members of audience as well as my co-panelists that you just simply allow me to adopt the already established protocols. I learned I have only 15 minutes to do the presentation. And uh, I don't even know up to now how I'm going to do that successfully. Because as a university lecturer, I teach for an average of two hours each time I enter a lecture room. So asking a lecturer to talk in just 15 minutes is actually challenging, but we will try to keep to that as best as we can. Um, my own topic of discussion, as you can see on the screen, is to talk of Islamic finance, values, and potential growth globally, but I will uh, place some emphasis on the continent of Africa. Um, bearing in mind that this is a conference that is African-centered, it's uh, African, uh, Takaful, and non-interest finance. And because of the time constraint, permit me to skip, uh, this is the agenda that I have, the items that I intended to run through, but I will have to skip the preliminary slides because of the time constraint. Issues relating to divination of Islamic finance, the growth, the size currently of Islamic financial market worldwide. By the time you get the full presentation, you can access all that. When we talk of values of Islamic finance, yes, Islamic finance is actually value oriented. It's guided by core values that are all derived from the Sharia principles based on the authorities of Al-Quran and Sunnah. And these principles that are guiding the operations of Islamic finance, uh, they offer, offer a range of benefits and opportunities, not only to individuals, but even to businesses, corporate entities, government, and the society at large. I have identified about five of those values for my presentation this afternoon, and I will go through them one after the other. The first value of Islamic finance is that it is a socially responsible investment. This is very important. Yes, I had one of the speakers this morning mentioning the fact that uh, Islamic finance is not a religious institution. It's actually a profit-oriented institution that is there to do business with the intention of generating profit. But it is not a free-for-all investment that we allow under Islamic finance. Uh, it's actually guided by this value of looking for what will be socially responsible what will be ethical conscious when you put your money in an investment you must never do it in a way that will be detrimental or harmful to the well-being and welfare of the society so that is the first major value of islamic finance that it actually promotes only socially responsible investment and when we talk of ethical or socially responsible investment uh, it has its own market as well. And that is why as Africa, we stand to gain, as Africans, we stand to gain by attracting those investors that actually uh, prioritize env environmental sustainability, fair labor practices, and community welfare, wherever they put their money. So it's an opportunity to attract that class of investors when we accommodate Islamic finance on the continent. The other value is that when we talk of Islamic finance principally, 
we are talking of a risk sharing mechanism. What do we mean by that? It actually states that based on a principle of Sharia that says, al gunmu bil gurmi wal kharaju bil daman. Profit, dividend, and losses or risks, they are actually inseparable. You cannot separate one from the other. Wherever you stand to gain, you must also be prepared to share part of the loss, if any. That is the true essence of Islamic finance. It promotes risk sharing. And uh, this is a conference uh, organized by a takaful entity. The careful as a product of Islamic finance is actually a good illustration of the risk sharing mechanism that is promoted by Islamic finance. When we talk of takaful, it is different principally from conventional insurance because in conventional insurance, risks are actually transferred. But in Islamic takaful insurance, risks are actually shared among the participants or policy holders. So this is an important value of Islamic finance that is a, is, is a, finance, is a financial system uh, that uh, takes very, very important the issue of risk sharing among the players. Value number three is that this Islamic finance looks after financial inclusion and ultimately economic empowerment. And that is why it ensures that individuals from all socioeconomic backgrounds or strata of the society are actually accommodated and given access to financial services. One unique characteristic of financial inclusion under Islamic finance is that Islamic finance does not see financial inclusion as an end on its own. It actually looks at it as a goal leading to an end. And what is that end? It is economic empowerment of the so included population. So we should always bear this in mind as a value of Islamic finance. We include people financially with a view to empowering them. And how do you achieve that? Through a number of steps. Product of Islamic finance that are geared towards financial inclusion must actually make sure that the poor, the less privileged in the society are considered as economic actors. They are given access to relevant markets. They are also exposed to suitable investment opportunities and they are given supporting infrastructure, appropriate funding and creation of smart partnership for them and also building their capacity. If we do all this, we will actually be moving from financial inclusion as a means to an end, which is economic empowerment. And that is where how the value of financial inclusion manifests actually under Islamic finance. Value number four of the values of Islamic finance is the sustainable and ethical investment. And that is why you will realize that when we talk of, let's take SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals of SDGs, or which are usually summarized under ESG, Environmental, Governance, and Social, you will see that all these align with the overall objectives of Sharia, which we know as Makosidu Sharia and by extension with the overall objectives of Islamic finance. Look at all these social, environmental uh, goals of SDGs or ESG. They are actually either to protect our lives, protect our wealth, or protect our uh, procreation by way of ensuring the continuity of human race and to protect our intellect. These are the five major objectives of Sharia which by extension become the five fundamental objectives of Islamic finance. So it's a value of Islamic finance that it takes care of investment. It's, on, it's only interested in investments that are sustainable and are ethical in nature. And lastly, prohibition of interest. It's an important value that cannot be glossed over. 
when we are talking of Islamic finance. This is an identifier, one of the major identifiers of Islamic finance. Yes, it prohibits dealing in riba, either by way of giving or by way of taking. Why? Because riba is considered to be interest, is considered to be exploitative. And I can't see a better statement to illustrate this fact than what we have. Um, the operator, these slides are not moving at all. What is happening? I supposed to be on slide 10 now, but I see the, front, uh, the second slide being displayed. Who is in charge of that, please? You want the audience to follow, okay. You can stop there. I said it's an important value of Islamic finance that it prohibits dealing in interest because it, is, it sees it as exploitative. And this is one of the best ways of illustrating it. A statement made by former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Go back to that slide of Prato. No, this is not the slide. I'm talking of slide 10, prohibition of riba or interest. President Obasanjo in 2000 and in year 2000 lamented that Nigeria borrowed $5 billion, ended up paying $16 billion, and yet was owing $28 billion. And he concluded by saying, if you ask me what the worst thing in the world is, I would say, it is compound interest. So it's a value, it's a major value of Islamic finance that it actually prohibits dealing in interest. Now, if we apply all these values that I've just enumerated, they must lead us to a destination. And that destination is to see the impact on the society. Meaning that wherever or whenever we are not seeing some of this impact that I'm going to mention now, it means we have to look back and see whether we are holding dearly, whether we are actually implementing, applying the, the true values of Islamic finance. Now, so let's talk briefly about the impact that Islamic finance should have automatically when we bring on board all these values that I've just mentioned. Value number one, uh, uh, sorry, impact number one, still not moving. The op operator. Okay. Okay. You want me to do it? Okay. 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 No, it's not moving again. So the first impact that we expect to see in the society, if we truly implement what Islamic finance is, is that it must result in poverty alleviation and social welfare, especially through what we call Islamic social finance. Uh, the next slide will give us some figures coming from a, an internationally reputable organization, uh, UN. Uh, HCR, that is United Nations High Commission for Refugees, it stated in its report in 2022 that in 21 countries and impacting about 1.5 million refugees and IDPs through the instrument of Zakat and Sodako. You can see the statistics, including some African countries, Nigeria and other African countries, that people were actually impacted, especially the poor and the less privileged, through the instrument of zakat and sodaka as product of Islamic finance. We also expect to see in the society as an impact for the implementation of the values of Islamic finance that women who are usually considered in every society as having lesser opportunities to economic advantages. We want to see the empowerment of women. So women empowerment is actually a major impact that we should expect to see if we bring on board all the values of Islamic finance. Number three, even in terms of education and healthcare initiatives, there is another product of Islamic finance that we call WAC. WAC has been used all over the world to establish schools, universities, hospitals, 
and other institutions that have a lot of benefit to the society. And at this point, because this is a Takaful, essentially a Takaful uh, centered uh, conference, I want to throw up a challenge for the operators in Nigeria. We are talking about the impact of Islamic finance in the area of education and healthcare initiatives. I don't know what is keeping you away up till today, as far as my findings are concerned. I've not seen any Takaful operator venturing into the healthcare product of Takaful, using Takaful for healthcare. All what I've seen in circulation, either NHAIS, that is the national one, or state-based one, they are all conventional insurance-based. Why? Takaful is a good product that can work effectively by letting people see the benefits and the real values of Islamic finance. So that is a challenge for our Takaful operators, and I think we have a golden opportunity at a conference like this to throw up such a challenge. This is another uh, impact that automatically we should expect to see uh, by way of supporting small and medium enterprises. I've given the figures that is coming from IDB, Islamic Development Bank, uh, mentioning the billions of dollars that have been uh, spent in intervention in various areas, energy, agriculture, by way of supporting SMEs through Islamic financial products. Sustainable development initiatives, particularly uh, when we talk of green school that are being issued all over the world today, is part of the way of seeing the impact of Islamic financial values implemented in the society. The social impact is also part of it. Uh, social impact of Islamic finance is also a good way of seeing the impact. Uh, recently, a few days ago, I read an online news item announcing that a UK-based firm uh, actually launched a social impact school for housing, bridging housing deficit in the UK. And if UK is thinking in this way of trying to bridge housing deficit, I don't know where we will be in Africa. The truth of the matter is that housing deficit is a global phenomenon, is a global challenge but it's felt more on the continent of Africa. The reason being that many studies have established this. One of the major contributors to housing deficit in the world is what we call rural urban migration. And this is happening at a very large scale on the continent of Africa. But there is a study by UN Habitat that states that by year 2025, just two years from today, almost half of the population of Africans will be living in urban centers. So we'll have more problem in this area. And uh, for those who will argue that we have no deficit, we, we will have no deficit, there are houses. I think we should look at the scientific definition of housing deficit its own. How do we arrive at a conclusion in any country that you have a deficit or we don't have? We have two parameters to that. Is either you have affordable housing that is inadequate or you have adequate housing that is unaffordable. Either way, there is a deficit. Deficit does not mean we don't have enough houses. You can have adequate housings but not affordable. Sometimes you can have affordable housing, but they are not inadequate. So I think this is uh, it should be an eye opener. If UK is thinking that way, I think we have a bigger challenge in terms of housing deficit. And Sukuk, social impact Sukuk could be a soccer in that regard for us on the continent of Africa. At the last lap of the presentation, we were to talk of the values as well as the potential growth, particularly in Africa. Here I've identified, but before I go there, I think I mentioned something, okay. Um, in 2017, in 2017, Bank Negara Malaysia, that is Central Bank of Malaysia, uh, released uh, uh, findings of a study on Islamic finance in Africa. And it identif identified three key pillars that are driving Islamic finance in Africa, namely financial inclusion, stimulation of economic activities, especially through funding and financing of SME activities and infrastructure.
on the, these are the three key pillars of Islamic finance on the continent of Africa. But beyond that, we can also explore other potential, other key factors that could contribute to the growth of Islamic finance on the continent. And I'm going to mention about five of them speedily. Number one is the rapidly expanding market. Africa is a natural market for Islamic finance. I'm happy I had uh, Alaji Kari mention in this morning that Muslim population on the continent is in the region of 300 million um, men and women. So when you have such a huge market, natural, natural market for you, that should be an opportunity that should be, should be explored and exploited towards enhancing the introduction of Islamic finance on the continent. Number two, we have many untapped potential. What do we mean by that? We go back to the issue of financial inclusion. If you look at the rate of inclusion on the continent of Africa, it's one of the lowest in the world. It's like uh, a parable that was given this morning that nobody is wearing shoe here. Here is a market for you to sell shoes. <laughs> In Africa, we have very high rate of financial exclusion. People are excluded financially. I've given some of the statistics here. Um, like in Niger, our neighbor here, the financially included adult population in Niger is just only 3.5%. It's only 10.9 in Congo. It's only 7.9 in Somalia. It's only 19% in Tanzania and 17.2% in Zimbabwe. I didn't omit Nigeria, but Nigeria is doing fairly well this day. We have about 44%, 44.2% rate. And as I mentioned in my inaugural lecture, delivered about two years ago, that studies upon studies have established this. Introduction of Islamic finance is a major driver of financial inclusion, the growth in financial inclusion that the country is experiencing. There is no doubt about that one. So we can take that beyond Nigeria, look at uh, markets that are st we still have very large number, percentage of people that are financially excluded. And that could be an opportunity of introducing uh, Islamic finance to such markets. Number three of the factors that could boost the growth of Islamic finance on the continent is the government support. We have very, very friendly, I'm always done, I'm almost done. Very, very friendly regulatory environment on the continent. I don't think they have it on other continents, maybe Asia. But in Africa, we have very friendly regulatory environment. Many countries are coming up now to introduce one form or another of regulation of Islamic finance. Though they are ready for you. Uh, about two months, two, three months ago, I was privileged to be invited by the Central Bank of Nigeria as a resource person for staff from Tanzania. The Central Bank of Tanzania, Bank of Tanzania, sent a team to Nigeria to come and understudy us how we are regulating Islamic finance in Nigeria to replicate same at home. Uganda has even uh, uh, like a new law of regulating their financial sector with a view to accommodating Islamic finance. So we have a very friendly regulatory environment, which I termed as being the government support for the growth of Islamic finance. Number four is that we have diverse economies on the continent. It's not limited to banking. You can come through banking, come through insurance, come through capital markets, come through microfinance initiatives. So there are a lot of opportunities that will be seen as factors for the growth of Islamic finance in Africa. And finally, one of the potentially major drivers in future, in the next few years, of the growth of Islamic finance in Africa is the emerging market of Islamic fintech. This is a new and emerging market. And I'm happy it's part of what has been discussed here in this conference. It's an emerging market. But Africa is still playing minimally in that market. Look at it, look at it, look at the statistics. Um, uh, the market is still being led by Indonesia with 20%. Imagine, surprisingly, followed by UK. UK is following an Islamic fintech. I'm not saying fintech generally, Islamic fintech. Fintech meant for Islamic finance. UK is having the share of 15% of that market, followed by UAE with 14%, and 
and Saudi Arabia with 13 percent. Um, we have some players from Africa, but I said minimally. Uh, Egypt and Nigeria have each two percent of the of the share of that market. So we need to do more. It will become another booster for the growth of Islamic finance on the continent. In conclusion. By tapping into Africa's potential for Islamic finance growth, financial institutions can financial institutions can strategically position themselves to benefit from the continent expanding Muslim population, untapped opportunities, friendly regulatory environment, diverse economies, and the emerging fintech market. Ultimately, all this will contribute to inclusive and sustainable economic development for all. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I can change seats with you. Then, yeah, I'll, you <laughs> no, then I'll sit by the side. No, no, no. Thank you everyone for listening to uh, Professor Alaro. I'm sure you must have learned it's very precise, very easy.